The Bible tells us about eight temples, at least eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I'm going to give you a brief little history uh, relating to especially the opening three or four of these. I'll mention them all, but I'm going to keep number five as a sort of a secret. It'll be on the mystery list until we get into the fuller teaching on today's telecast, because it's number five only, really, that I want to center upon and to emphasize. But we are going to briefly look at these eight uh, temples in the Bible. Number one, you remember the tabernacle in the wilderness. I've often put it this way. The children of Israel came out of Egypt. They'd been there for about 400 years, lost touch with God, only knew the Egyptian deities out in the wilderness. God wants to reveal himself. He can't go on television. He can't do it by radio or by tape or by fax or by printing. There's none of that in the wilderness. So he tells Moses to build him a temple a tent of meeting, a tabernacle, we call it normally because it was mobile. It was movable. It would have three rooms, and it would have seven pieces of furniture, every piece of furniture being very symbolic, very significant, and of course types and shadows of that which was to come, the full plan of redemption, Christ the Savior himself, being involved in all those types and shadows. So the first great tabernacle or temple is uh, the tabernacle in the wilderness, and it is so profound that the Bible takes 50 chapters, 5 zero, 50 chapters to describe the intricate details of the marvelous tabernacle in the wilderness, perhaps the greatest building ever built in many ways, even though it was mobile. Now, many years later, David wanted to build something along the lines of the tabernacle, only much bigger, and in a permanent way. He wanted to have it, of course, in Jerusalem, and uh, God told him the details of it, but wouldn't allow him to build it, because he said, you're a man of war, you've got blood on your hands, but your son is going to build it. And of course, it became known as Solomon's Temple. Everybody has heard of that. This was a more permanent one of stone and so forth, rather than just the linen and the other items of the mobile one back there in the wilderness. Solomon's temple was rather amazing. As a matter of fact, Solomon's temple, and I'm coming back to that in a moment, followed by Zerubbabel's temple and Herod the Great's temple, those three were all built on the same site, and that is Mount Moriah, the famous Mount Moriah in the Scriptures, in the eastern side there of Jerusalem. But relating to what started off looking like David's temple, but Solomon, his son, built it, it was absolutely incredible. It was built on a platform 10 foot high with like 10 steps up to it and two great pillars, one on each side, uh, filled with ornate perfection. It was, to put it mildly, a magnificent structure. It was Solomon's temple. In fact, he used, to be honest, slave labor, 80,000 of them to put it together. And when he was looking for the wood from Lebanon, there were 30,000 involved in just getting the wood cut and transported and prepared. <clears throat> it's hard for us to imagine today what a magnificent structure it was. It would cost tens of millions of dollars if it was built exactly today as it was back then. Solomon's Temple. But remember, after Solomon, the kingdom was divided. It was a tragedy. And Israel, as it were, became into two. The top part was uh, uh, made up of the ten tribes, which were taken captive into Assyria. Not Syria, Assyria, which is the northern part of Iraq today. And of course, they became known as the ten lost tribes. And then in the southern kingdom, it became known as Judah, because it only had two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and it took the name of the larger tribe. That's where the word Jew comes from. It's a contraction of the word Judah. Now, they were taken 
away also into Babylon, which is the lower part of Iraq today. And that was by King Nebuchadnezzar. He made three raids over there, destroyed the city, destroyed this magnificent Solomon's temple, and that destroyed the Jews just about. Because, see, the temple was the center of Jewish life. There men sought God and gave their sacrifices unto him, and now it was wiped out. It wasn't like us today. We have a different situation. They had that one meeting place, and it was gone. And Nebuchadnezzar was the one that uh, did it. And he took the Jews, as you know, back there for 70 years. See, what had happened was God had told them to tell the land uh, for six out of every seven years, and they refused to do it. They did it seven out of seven. So God was losing one-seventh all the time. He let it go for 490 years, then demanded his 70 years. So he let them go into captivity, and then the land lay for God's 70 years. Then Cyrus, the king, rose up from the Medes. And uh, we talk about the Medes and Persians. Uh, and uh, he overthrew Babylon and allowed the people to go back where they would build on the same site at the old famous Mount Moriah, they would build this um, second temple. Now, I must tell you something interesting about Cyrus, the heathen king who let the Jews go back. At least uh, he let them all go back, but only about 50,000 actually did it. This man's amazing. He was a heathen king, and God names him in the Bible as the man who would set the Jews free. But God names him, oh, between 100 and 200 years before he was even born. I guess God's got his hand on everything, doesn't he? Well, when they got back, <clears throat> they were very discouraged, but they were glad to be back in their home country. So they laid the foundation for the temple almost immediately. That was the most important thing. But you talk about getting more discouraged, so bad that they abandoned it for between 15 and 16 years. Nothing happened. And then through Zerubbabel, the governor, and Joshua, the high priest, not the other old famous Joshua, this was another one, Joshua, the high priest, and through Haggai, the old prophet, over 80, and his young sidekick, Zechariah, inspiring them, they did finally build it. So we have the tabernacle, and then we have Solomon's temple, and then we have what I've just uh, referred to as this one, Zerubbabel's temple. Solomon's temple was about a thousand years before Christ. This one, Zerubbabel's temple, was about 500 years before Christ. Why the importance? Well, it seems like God just loves a house. He wants to be in a house. You know, it's like God in the Old Testament has his musical preferences also. He loves trumpets. Read about it in the Old Testament. Personally, I like an accordion. God loves a trumpet blast and uses it all the time. Well, he likes a house. He likes to be in a house. And so we have God being in the tabernacle, in the uh, Shekinah glory. Then we have Solomon's temple. Then we have Zerubbabel's temple built on the same place. These were more permanent ones. And then... Uh, just before Christ, 15 or, uh, well, about 20 years uh, before Christ, 20, 25 years, somewhere in there, nobody knows exactly, Herod the Great, in order to curry a uh, favor of the Jews, he decided to take this Zerubbabel's temple, which had been standing for hundreds of years, and to um, enlarge it and beautify it. He ended up making it even greater than Solomon's temple. I mean, it became a magnificent piece with a big wall at the precinct. Of course, everything's gone today except one piece of one of the walls. Today, we call that the Wailing Wall, and that's, uh, you know, <laughs> over 2,000 years old, uh, an amazing uh, part of the wall that's still there. Now, here's an interesting point. When Zerubbabel's temple uh, was built, many of the old people who had remembered Solomon's temple, they wept because it didn't compare. And yet the Bible says the glory of this temple will be greater than the former. It'll be greater than Solomon's. And why would that be? Because it would be that temple, Zerubbabel's, which was beautified and enlarged. It became gold and cream and just magnificent by Herod the Great, and that would be the one that Jesus would actually stand in. 
And then Jesus said it would be torn down uh, so that one stone would not stand upon another because the people had rejected him. And about 40 years after Jesus died, Titus, the Roman general, came in in A.D. 70 and tore that one down. Now, let's go back over it again, will we? God wants to be in a house. So we have the uh, tabernacle in the wilderness. We have Solomon's temple. We have Zerubbabel's temple. We have heard the great's temple. So what's that? We have got four. And then there's, well, there's number five. But that's the secret one that I want to spend most time on this telecast talking about. So I'll skip it for the moment and then come back to it, and we'll go to number six. There is the temple uh, that will be built according to Revelation chapter 11. Some people refer to it as the tribulation temple, uh, but you can read Revelation chapter 11. And then there's going to be the temple built in the millennium. And Ezekiel in the Old Testament talks all about the millennium, not all about, but a lot about the millennium temple. And, of course, he was an Old Testament prophet, but he speaks about the millennium to come. Uh, that's seven. And then number eight, why the Bible talks away at the end, out, out in eternity. The Lord God Almighty and the Lamb will be the temple thereof. So we have these eight. I want you to get them. Recently I preached on this. You can order the tape if you want. I'm not offering anything today. But we have the tabernacle in the wilderness. We have Solomon's temple, Zerubbabel's temple. Then we've heard the great's temple. And then we have number five. That's the secret one. We're coming to it. And then we have the temple of Revelation 11. And then we have the Millennium Temple, and then we finally have that number eight, the Lord God Almighty, as the Bible puts it, and the Lamb are the temple thereof. That's eight. God wants to get inside a temple. Well, what is number five? Well, it's the staggering thing, because after A.D. 70, when that temple was torn down, the one that Herod the Great had made so wonderful, and uh, Jesus had stood in, it was torn down. There's no other arrangements for a temple. So we don't have to go to Jerusalem. It's nice to go, but you don't have to go to meet God in a temple at Jerusalem. Uh, the Mohammedans, they want to go, for example, to Mecca or, or some other shrine for different religions. A staggering thing happened mind-boggling, unthought of. The heathen gods, the people who worship them would never have thought of it because God suddenly revealed that all of that that had gone before was a type and shadow and that the real desire of God in getting into a house was to make you his house. So that the tabernacle in the wilderness, Solomon's temple, Zerubbabel's temple, and Herod the Great's temple, and whatever else, were actually types and shadows of God wanting to get inside us so that we would become God containers. I mean, if there is such a thing as demon possession, why could there not be Jesus possession? And this idea of the Almighty, a God. We know he's the only God. But, 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 but even back there in the eyes of the heathen, the idea that a God could get inside you, be there permanently, live in you, and come in with all his power without reducing himself was a mind-boggling thing. You ju it just didn't happen that way. For example, today in India, there are 660 million known gods by name because of all the heathen practices. They worship these gods from the, uh, from the rivers to the Ganges to whatever, to your ancestors. But they don't expect those gods to move about in them and live in them. But that's what God had in mind. And the New Testament is replete with references to this idea that we become God's mobile temple and that he lives in us so that we have resident within us a counselor, a friend, a doctor, the lawyer, 
the banker, whoever we need in reality is ours and inside of us. Now, for example, here is one scripture, and there are many that I want to give you as time allows. So, you know, you always have to have your thinking cap on and the VCR rolling and your notepad at the ready and the Bible open too when the telecast comes on the air. So I hope you've got your pen ready and start to write. Uh, this first one is 1 Corinthians 3 and verse uh, 16. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16. And I want to give it to you right now. Here's what it says. Know ye not that ye, that ye are the temple of God. I mean, the temple of God was Solomon's temple. Or, or it was the tabernacle in the wilderness. But here's this mind-boggling concept. How can it be? I mean, if, if you have something this big, can, can you put it into a container this big? No, you can't. You can't put a hundred gallons of water in a two-gallon bucket. How could God, who fills the eternity of the eternities, the Bible, you mean, well, remember the poet said, east is east and west is west, and the twain shall never meet. Well, you can go eastward forever, and God's there. Westward forever, and God's there. He fills the eternity of the eternities. Take the wings of the morning and go to the uttermost part of the sea, the psalmist said, and God is there. There's no place that he's not. He's ever-present. He's omnipresent. He fills everywhere. By the way, he's also our friend. How can that God, without reducing himself, come into a temple made of clay, not only tiny, but so inadequate and unworthy? We don't know. But the Apostle Paul says this. It actually happens. As a matter of fact, Paul was the one who was plucked from being a Pharisee, taken out into the Arabian desert, and God, for three years, just a little bit over three years, God revealed to him what Paul himself said is the mystery of the gospel. Well, what is the mystery of the gospel? Well, first of all, Paul said it's been hidden from generations. Even the Old Testament prophets didn't know it. They saw through a glass darkly. But Paul was the one that got the revelation. And what was it? Well, he said, here is the revelation of the mystery of the gospel hid from the ages. Nobody else got it. Peter and them didn't get it. Paul got it and revealed it in his writings. And here it is, Christ in you, the only hope of glory, so that we walk about literally as God containers. Now, obviously, we don't get arrogant about that nor prideful because we still realize that we're people of flesh, and within ourselves and by ourselves, we are useless and weak. But with Him, we can do all things, and we become an amazement to our friends, a consternation to our enemies, because when it looks like the ship is sinking, or the house is burning down, or everything's going wrong, we claim the promises of God, knowing that we don't have to go to Jerusalem or Mecca or somewhere else. God is within us. Paul said it's the mystery of the ages. It is the revelation of God, Christ in you. And speaking here to these Corinthians, and by the way, I've told you before that these Corinthians were not very... Uh, spiritual. As a matter of fact, they, they were a nuisance. They gave Paul more trouble than all other churches put together. And yet, in their inadequacy, but because of their trust in Christ, he said, ye are the temple, not made like the tabernacle, or Solomon's temple, or Zerubbabel's temple, or Herod the Great's temple, but human beings become the abiding place of God. Well, here it is again. Paul says it almost with an air of amazement. After I've taught you, you still don't know it? Know ye not? Don't you realize? Has it not struck you, this mind-boggling privilege, that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells inside you? So inside me, and inside you, if we have made the trust connection, accepting his righteousness, DK eusene is the Greek word of imparted, imputed righteousness, not just making a so-called, quote, decision, 
and not just shaking the preacher's hand or going to church, but if you've actually trusted Christ and he's put his Spirit in you in response to your trust for his robe of righteousness, then you become the temple of God. It is mind-boggling. And God is so thrilled with it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, now there's a bunch of these, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Here's what it says. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, I'll, pass, I'll read 20 as well. What? Paul says, what? They still hadn't got it. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Verse 20, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's belong to him. You can look up these scriptures afterwards in the living or the amplified or whatever however you want, but these are powerful scriptures to give the idea that God is going to be resident in millions of people. Individually, they become the temple of the Lord, but when they come together, each is a living stone, and the overall church then is the temple of God. I guess it's just absolutely incredible. Look at one more in 2 Corinthians 6 and 16. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, I believe it is, and verse uh, 16. Second Corinthians, yeah. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. The Greek is, I will walk about in them and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. For you are a temple of the living God, because God said, I will dwell in you, and I will walk about in you, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and I will meet with you there in your being, so that, you know, if the telephone wires are cut and the pastor's out of town and you can't reach your friend, let me tell you, drop at the side of your bed or wherever you are. You have an immediate audience with God because he's there with you, never to leave you nor forsake you. Did you get a note of all eight of those? Do you know about the various temples in the Bible? And do you know about the mind-boggling fulfillment of all things? Christ in you, the hope of glory? In fact, away at the end, when the devil is defeated and God's purposes are being wrought out in eternity, God has the triumph because he says that he is tabernacled in man. Man becomes, as it were, the tent for God to move into, and we become God-possessed, Jesus-possessed people who can carry out the purposes of God, both in time and in eternity. What scriptures these are! Now listen, uh, there's so many scriptures, Now I want to get them all to you, so I hope you're writing here. Let me try to give you one more right at this time. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6, Hebrews 3, let me see if I've got time, because we're coming up on a break. Hebrews chapter, what did I say, 3 and verse 6. Yeah, here uh, it is. But Christ as a son over his own house... Whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. God-possessed. We've heard too much about demon possession. There is such a thing. I believe in it. I believe people can be set free. But we're God-possessed and we're Jesus-possessed. And it is absolutely wonderful. I don't have an offer, but we love God's word around here. And ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost, the mystery of the ages revealed, Christ in you, without reducing himself, the only hope of glory. God likes to be in a house. Eight temples mentioned in Scripture, at least eight. The tabernacle in the wilderness, Solomon's temple, Zerubbabel's temple, 
which Haggai and Zechariah and Joshua all had such a part in, Herod the Great's temple, those three all built on the same spot, Mount Moriah, in Jerusalem. Number five, we are the temple of the Lord. Number six, the temple of Revelation chapter 11, which some have called the Tribulation Temple. Number seven, what Ezekiel describes in such detail, known as the temple built in the millennium. And number eight, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple thereof in eternity. God wants to get in. See, when Jesus came to this earth, it really, in so many ways, was God's first opportunity to, get, to, to really possess a human body. The Old Testament prophets like Abraham and David and these preachers and, and messengers of the Lord would say things like, God is above us and God is around us and God is with us and God will never leave us. But for us, it took Peter at the day of Pentecost to make it clear that God is in us. And with the passage of time, we have almost got used to this mind-boggling concept that a God can possess his subjects. It doesn't seem possible that the God would do it. And yet that's what happens with us. And so when Jesus came, you remember he was baptized in water by John in the River Jordan, when his head came up and opened the waters, his obedience opened heaven. And God said, this is my beloved son in whom, not just with whom, in whom I am well pleased. I am well pleased to be possessing a human body. That's what God wants. Then he expresses himself. He loves us. He comforts us. He strengthens us. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. He doesn't say, you know, well, I'll tell you what, uh, I'll meet you in a week or two. Or uh, uh, if you send me a few dollars, then I'll make a special arrangement to meet you every other month. I will never leave you nor forsake you forever and forever and forever. Before we had the break, I was mentioning something about the fact that as individual believers, we are God's house. But when we become as a, a part of the body of Christ, uh, which we do when we get saved, there's another way to describe us. We are that, that, that uh, house, but we're also lively stones in the overall house, so that each individual is the house of the Lord, but God also possesses the church as an entity. Now, that's borne out in 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. Ye also, says Peter, as lively stones, we would say today, living stones. That's where the word living stone came from. Ye also as living stones are built up into a spiritual house, both individually, as I've said, and part of the body of Christ. And we are an holy priesthood. I mean, the old priesthood is gone. You don't need a priest today to confess to and, and to make intercession for you because all believers are kings and priests unto God who sing a new song. So what are we? We're living stones. We're a spiritual house, individually and collectively. We are a holy priesthood. A set of holy hagios, a different kind of priesthood. That's what it means. Uh, a set apart, dedicated totally to God, a priesthood in touch with him, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes the devil, when he uses his most familiar club, which is condemnation and guilt, he wants to make you feel that God's not pleased with you or anything you do. But here it says, when we offer up as living stones, the spiritual house and the holy priesthood, when we lift up spiritual sacrifices, we offer unto God, we glorify God. The Bible says they are acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Ye are the temple of God, the amazing mystery of the ages revealed. 
Christ in you, the hope of glory. So that as you go around, no, no, you don't become arrogant or a smart aleck, but you're aware that you're different than other people. We don't say better, of course not, but we say different. Because you're possessed by God and you know that you're more than a conqueror. You know no matter what happens, you're going to win because of the trust connection and who you've got inside you. It's an amazing situation that we have such people in this earth. Most people in, the, in this earth, of course, are, are human bodies filled with themselves, some filled with the devil, but there's a minority filled with God. They're God containers. It's amazing. And if we would but get these truths into our heads, we would sure change forever. Here's one in John. I'm going to go back to John chapter 14 and verse 20. John, the Gospel of John, 14 and verse 20. Wow, you talk about something else. Did I get hold of this? John chapter 14, I'm almost there, and verse 20. Here's what it says. At that day, Jesus speaking, ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. As he is one with the Father, so we are one with him and the Father. We're allowed in. This eternal fellowship and relationship that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have had for all eternity, we're allowed in. No, we don't become an extension of the Godhead. We're not little gods. I don't believe in that theory. We're still sinners saved by grace. But the oneness that the Father and the Son has uh, speaks to the oneness that we now have with them and with, 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 with the Holy Spirit because we're in Christ and Christ is in us. You know, if you take a bottle and you fill it with water, the water's in the bottle. But if you take it down to the seaside and throw it in, now you've got the bottle in the water. So you've got the water in the bottle and the bottle in the water. We're in Christ and Christ is in us. We're filled with Christ and then we're baptized in Christ. This is staggering. I know I've repeated it. I do it for emphasis. It's the mystery of the ages. Paul said it. Christ in you. The hope of glory. And here Jesus says at that day, one day we're fully going to see him. You know, the, the word glory, doxa, or as the Greek said, thoxa. Uh, the, the, the greatest glory of all is when you finally are able to move past, seeing through a glass darkly, and you really comprehend him. Heaven will be to have the ability to know him as he is. That's what the glory is. And that itself will be a developing operation for all of eternity. And Jesus said, at that day ye shall know, ye shall understand, ye shall comprehend. See, the Bible says no man hath seen God. Not talking about this, talking about comprehended God at any time, except that Jesus came and revealed him. Now we do see through a glass darkly, but one day face to face, and at that day ye shall know, ye shall know and understand, I am in the Father, but ye are in me. What is this? Here's the, here's the Father. Christ is in the Father, but inside Christ is us. So our lives are hid with Christ in God. One more time. Our lives are hid with Christ in God. We become God-possessed, and we can carry out his work. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. John 17 and verse 23. Now, when you hear this one, I and them, Jesus said, and thou and me, that they may, may be made perfect in one, or complete is the word, and that the world may know, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Listen to the opening three words. I in them. The concept of Jesus' possession, regrettably, is 
more seemingly unbelievable to believers than the concept of demon possession. Uh, they, they think people can be demons. Oh, yeah, well, what about Jesus possessed? Jesus said, I am them. I am in them. Who is this Jesus? You remember last week we talked about who is he in yonder stall? We talked about how mighty and how wonderful he is. The Logos who was there at the very beginning and before the beginning, the that behind all that. Who what? Who made everything? For without him was nothing made that was made. This almighty God, Elohim and Yahweh and El Shaddai, he said, I in them. I am in them. And thou in me, that they may be complete in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So we receive Christ's righteousness by trust, and this becomes our standing. See the difference between our standing and our state? Our standing is we accept D.K. Usine, the righteousness of Christ, and we are accepted by God like Christ is. Amazing. But in ourselves, in our state, we're still developing and learning and up and down and battling and fighting. But your state doesn't dictate your standing. It's your trust in the finished work of Christ. When you understand those things and grab them, then there's a deposit of God. God himself comes into you. And you become a different man. Let me tell you, you become a different person. And most people live about five million miles below their privileges. And don't understand how we can get a grip of God and get miracles and blessings from him in order to bless others. These scriptures are rather incredible. What about Galatians 2, verse 20? Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Well, that means he ought to be dead. But this is what he said. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to go to Ephesians. Ephesians, let me get it after Galatians. Ephesians chapter 3. And here it's coming up, verses 17 through 19. Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. Ready for it? I know I'm going fast. I'm trying to get it all in. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That's the whole thing. The church tells you it's by works. It's not. It's by faith in what he did on Calvary. That ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend, to understand with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. No wonder the famous uh, Graham Scroggy, that great writer, uh, wrote books called The Unfolding Drama of Redemption. The more you study this thing, the more mind-boggling it is. But it said as we understand that we have accepted him by faith, we become rooted and grounded in love, then God starts to open our eyes to truths. That's what annoys me about so much what goes on today, cheapening Christianity, a bunch of emotionalism, jumping around, getting nowhere, foolishness, and you don't learn, you learn nothing. Did you ever come out of a service and say to yourself, what did I learn there? You ever watch something on TV and say, what did I learn there? You're supposed to learn. Because when we learn, we're feasting on Christ. And that's what causes us to comprehend what? With all the saints, what is the length and the breadth and the depth and the height of this mighty revelation, which was hid from the ages. And then he says something strange. And to know, he said, to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. Now, wait a minute. He actually said to know something that you can't know. He said to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. You know it, but you can't know it. That's true, because you know it in your heart, even though you'll never fully be able to explain it with your mind. But you experience it. And uh, your mind grasps it to the best that you can give yourself and study. But God is still God, 
and a billion, gillion years from now, we'll still be comprehending him. To know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be... Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Does it really say this? That ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. God? I mean, right now, God's in India. He's in Africa. He's in America. He's in Belfast, believe it or not. God is everywhere, and God in all his fullness is going to come in and possess us. That's what it says. That's the revelation. That ye might be filled with all the fullness of God, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. I mean these verses. Let me see. Do I have... Do I have time, I was going to say, for one more verse? Perhaps I do. In Colossians, yes, I do. Colossians 1, 27, if I go quickly. Colossians 1, 27 says, To whom? I've been quoting it all through the telecast, but here it is. To whom God would make known what is... Do you like this, this kind of language? To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery that he would make it known unto the Gentiles through him, through Paul, which is what? Well, there it is. Colossians 1, 27. It is Christ in you. You become his temple. Not Solomon's temple anymore, or Zerubbabel's, or Herod the Great's temple. It's you. And it's Christ in you, the only and the eternal hope of glory. Oh, my goodness. It's mind-boggling. It is mind-boggling. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I just have a couple of minutes, and I want your mind to be filled with this thought, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Ye are the temple of God. Well, I got a few seconds. The other scripture was Revelation 3.20. It was Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, this is awful fast. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Do you see the order? Jesus said, I want in to your heart. And when I come in, he said, I will sup with him. In other words, he wants to know what's on our table, which is garbage and sin and evil. He said, I will sup with you. He sups it up, forgives it, and it disappears. Now he said, he will sup with me. We, we get transferred from one table to his, from our table to his table, and on his table are the gifts of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit and the anointing of God and God's promises and all kinds of wonderful things. Allow him in. When he comes in, he will sup at your table to put it right, and then forevermore you'll be dining at his table.